Hello. That was a section from my orchestral piece, The Tower of Oxantium. Accordingly, I've come to an obelisk in the Belvedere Park because I need some clear air. I want to look further at Rossellian monism and in particular how it's derived from the Weimar identity thesis. I also want to look at David Chalmers' justification of the theory and how it's supported by a combinatorial approach to possible world semantics and by Kripke's definition of natural kinds. Rossellian monism owes its name to Bertrand Russell, who was well connected in European intellectual culture at the beginning of the 20th century and who, today, is considered another of the grandfathers of analytic philosophy, able to dwell on big picture issues while simultaneously analysing the use of language and other tools used as methods of inquiry. He had communicated with Frege at Jena. It was he who'd sent the devastating letter about music practice rooms mentioned in episode 22, and then, building upon the older man's predicate logic, went on to develop his own theory of descriptions, which added a third function to the existential and predicate functions able to take sentences like the present king of France is bold, and address the meaning of the word the. He was also closely associated with Wittgenstein at Oxford, who in turn was connected with Carnap, who had also been at Jena for a lengthy spell and was in turn involved himself with the early formulations of what was originally called neutral monism. Russell had rejected both idealism and idealist monism as a young man, yet the enigmas revealed by his thoroughgoing realism, whereby even the Iphigenia myth is to be considered in some sense real, given it has a name attributed to it, eventually led him back to a form of Neoplatonism and thereafter a new form of reductive monism. Neutral monism is a metaphysical theory that seeks to address the mind-body problem. If naturalism claims that the intrinsic nature of existence is a physical one, and if idealism, at least in its radical form, claims the intrinsic nature of existence is a mental one, then neutral monism shares with them the conviction that everything is of one substance, but that this one substance is neither intrinsically mental nor physical. It's neutral between the two. Bertram Russell explored these ideas in several articles during a 20-year period beginning in 1912. He began his second article in On the Nature of Acquaintance. Neutral monism, as opposed to idealistic monism and materialistic monism, is the theory that the things commonly regarded as mental and the things commonly regarded as physical do not obtain in respect of an intrinsic property possessed by the one set and not by the other, but differ only in respect of arrangement and context. More recently, Leopold Stubenberg added to this. The idea it conveys is that all particulars are intrinsically the same. So, if sensations are neutral because they're intrinsically neither mental nor physical, and all other particulars have the same intrinsic nature as sensations, then all particulars are neutral, at least according to the first definition of neutrality. Superficially, it seems the only difference between this argument and the analogy between mind and nature proposed by the Weimar Identity Thesis is that of a shared intrinsicality. Although it seems reasonable to suggest this is implied by the shared theory of Weimar idealists. Using Frege's propositional logic, I can show this difference more clearly. The Weimar Identity Thesis is a biconditional theorem whereby the mental is equivalent to the material. From if P then Q, and if Q then P, I infer P and Q are biconditional. Expressed formally, that's to say that it is the case that P if and only if Q. Thereafter, I can show how Russellian monism introduces a third entity, the truth maker that enables the equivalency between the physical and the mental, between P and Q. It posits that an intrinsic entity, I, is the underlying cause of both P and Q. The formal argument is shown on the screen. The first three lines of premises, if I then P, if intrinsic substance underpins the physical, then it follows that the physical exists. If I then Q, if intrinsic substance underpins the mental, then it follows that the mental exists. However, these first two premises are not sufficient in and of themselves to establish I due to the rule of material implication. If P then Q entails not P or Q. Subsequently, the third line must assert the premise I. The fourth and fifth lines use the rule of modus ponens to establish P and Q, and the sixth line is a conjunction of the two. The conditional proof of the last line shows the intrinsic substance underpinning both the physical and the mental. Let me take a step back to put this in context. 
If physical monism eliminates any role for the mind, a view which is rejected by many as ludicrous, and idealistic monism eliminates any role for the physical, a view which is also rejected by many as ludicrous, and if the would-be compromise of dualism leads to epiphenomenalism, which is rejected as even more ludicrous by everybody, then the Weimar identity thesis, by way of its view of equivalence between the mind and nature, incorporates an approach that is reconciliatory rather than explicitly monistic or dualistic. Russellian monism seeks to build on this by filling a gap left by the original theory. It commits to monism and explores the implication of this, the essential nature of the link between the mental and the physical, which in turn allows for the phenomenal analogies perceived between mind and nature. Schelling had argued that mind and nature are equivalent, and Hegel had sought to identify some of the properties of this equivalency, including explaining the nature of the equivalency in terms of these analogies. However, in the German idealism of the Weimar tradition, under Kant's influence, epistemology had eclipsed metaphysics. In hindsight, it's possible to say it required the insight of somebody standing outside the tradition, somebody such as Russell, to apply the metaphysical insight required to move the thesis further. Russell said, The affinities of a given thing are quite different in the two orders, and its causes and effects obey different laws. Two objects may be connected in the mental world by the association of ideas, and in the physical world by the law of gravitation. Russell's contribution to the theory, something that I haven't mentioned yet, lies in the fact that, although his neutral monism remains a metaphysical theory, it also looks to matters of nomology for its justification. Modern exponents of the theory continue to look to science and argue that current scientific theory pertaining to fundamental properties is inadequate given a. it cannot explain the nature of matter that underpins its materialist paradigm, b. it cannot explain consciousness, and c. it's unable to answer the conceivability argument, which I introduced previously. Russellian monism argues that a new empirical theory must be developed by science that resolves these three objections and links the mental world with the material world in a way that overcomes the explanatory gap evident in materialism and the epiphenomenalism of dualism. The modern version of the theory is described by Kriegel as the view that the universe includes some special properties that underlie and are more basic than both mental and physical properties. They are, in fact, both proto-mental and proto-physical. Their proto-mental status neutralises the explanatory gap, while their proto-physical status neutralises the problem of causal inertia. However, establishing an alternate science theory is made difficult for reason of the paradigm governing naturalism. David Chalmers characterised the problem in terms of three arguments. First, physical descriptions of the world characterise the world in terms of structure and dynamics. Second, from truths about structure and dynamics, one can deduce only further truths about structure and dynamics. Third, truths about consciousness are not truths about structure and dynamics. Chalmers has been an influential exponent of Russellian monism, and I want to use the remainder of this episode to look at his justification for the theory. With apologies to Mr Chalmers for my many oversimplifications and any errors I might make along the way. Anybody who wants to get the fully-fledged account can read Chalmers himself or my other references. Incidentally, as I've mentioned before, Chalmers has also spoken about panpsychism, which shares many similarities with neutral monism. There are some differences, but in my opinion they're trivial. Some neutral monists argue that the whole point of neutral monism is its reductive argument, which panpsychism rejects. They also point out that panpsychism posits that the basic entity is consciousness, whereas neutral monism posits that the basic entity is intrinsically neither mental nor physical. These points could be interpreted as significant if it weren't for the fact that the neutrality of orthodox neutral monism is not really very neutral. Stubenberg said, The type of objection most frequently raised against neutral monism expresses the suspicion that it is a mental, not a neutral monism. The allegedly neutral elements are taken to be either wholly or partial mental. This concern is stated in different ways. It is said, for instance, that neutral monism is a form of Berkeleyan idealism, of phenomenalism, or of panpsychism. 
putting aside these differences, I'm going to speak of Russellian monism, as Chalmers does, in broad terms that encompass a whole range of the tradition from neutral monism to panpsychism, from realism to anti-realism. In his article, Does Conceivability Entail Possibility?, Chalmers identifies five steps needed to justify the coherency of Russellian monism. In the first step, he restates the conceivability argument, whereby it's possible to conceive a world without phenomenal entities. The world we live in, the actual world, possesses mind, but it's coherent to conceive of a possible world in metaphysical terms that doesn't possess mind. Chalmers calls this the zombie world. He posits the argument, it is necessary that there is a world. It is possible that everybody in the world is not phenomenally conscious. They're zombies. The argument asserts it's conceivable that an exact physical duplicate of the world might exist, whereby all properties remain the same except one, that there's no phenomenal consciousness. The nomology of existence, the laws of nature, and for instance the activity of subatomic particles remains the same, subjects possessing the same neurobiological structure in their brains and acting in exactly the same way, behaving as if in a sensory state, but lacking the actual feel of phenomenal consciousness. According to Chalmers, these subjects should be considered as zombies, alive yet without the experience of being alive. He said, in conceiving of a physically identical world, we are really only conceiving of a world that is identical from the standpoint of physical investigation, while differing in the inaccessible essential properties, which are also the properties that guarantee consciousness. Again, I'd like to present this in terms of more formalised modal logic, which uses propositional logic with the addition of a square to represent the concept of necessity, and a diamond for possibility. I'll also present the formulation to show its interpretation by possible world semantics. In this formulation, square P indicates it is necessary that P, which means that it is necessary that P is true if and only if P is true in all possible worlds is true. Similarly, diamond D indicates it is possible that P, which means, according to possible world semantics, that it is possible that P is true if and only if P is true in at least one possible world is true. Here's a second example, introducing a new variable Q and also the AND and the NOT signs. The quantified modal logic is taken to mean it is necessary that P is true if and only if P is true in all possible worlds is true. And it is possible that NOT Q is true if and only if NOT Q is true in at least one possible world is true. Or, it is necessary that the gods demand the sacrifice of Iphigenia is true, if and only if the gods demand the sacrifice of Iphigenia is true in all possible worlds. And, it is possible that Iphigenia doesn't object to being sacrificed is true, if and only if Iphigenia doesn't object to being sacrificed is true in at least one possible world. Or, it is nomically necessary that P i.e. naturalism, incorporating the laws of nature, is true if and only if P is true in all possible worlds, and it is combinatorially possible that not Q, i.e. no phenomenal consciousness, is true if and only if not Q is true in at least one possible world. The last example shows how Chalmers attributes a particular semantic to the logic structure, that of combinatorialism, which he needs to derive his second step of five. He recognises that there are some things we can conceive that are not to be taken seriously. Just because we can conceive a zombie world, it doesn't make it an actual possibility. So, he establishes three rules for establishing the credibility of a conceivable hypothesis that will elevate it from the level of mere conceivability to actual possibility. He says that a genuine possibility is an entity that a. stands up to coherent argument, i.e. it doesn't contradict what's already known and therefore has epistemic validity, b. cannot be ruled out rationally, it doesn't contradict the laws of logic, including the law of non-contradictions and therefore has logical validity, and c. meets the standards of nomic counterfactuality and therefore has scientific validity. I'll look at each of these three standards in a little more depth. 
The first standard pertaining to epistemic validity compares a conceivable situation that is justified by first impressions versus one that is true because it can stand up to reason. For instance, the gambler's hunch, whereby the throw of a fair coin resulting in three heads in a row entails the next throw will more likely be a head, might be justified as coherent in the first instance. However, leaving out the possible implications of cubism, probability reasoning reveals it as a fallacy. In the case of the zombie argument, Chalmers argues that the significance of phenomenal consciousness is such that it's not credible to countenance its elimination from the world as we live in it today. However, it is perfectly reasonable to posit the possibility that the universe might have developed complex life without self-reflective mind. The second standard pertaining to rational validity compares a conceivable situation that is justified by virtue of the facts versus one that is true merely by virtue of the act it cannot be ruled out. For instance, a report of the throw of a fair coin resulting in a hundred heads in a row may be justified by supporting evidence or by the fact it cannot be ruled out. The third standard is the most important to Chalmers' case as regards his use of possible world semantics. Stepping back from his previous contradictions of Kripke, it compares a conceivable entity that is justified in terms of nomic counterfactuality or combinatorialism versus one that is a mere metaphysical possibility. For instance, if the throw of a fair coin results in a head, it's counterfactually possible, according to the laws of nature, setting aside the most radical forms of determinism, that it might have resulted in a tail. In contrast, it's metaphysically possible that it might not have resulted in a head or a tail at all, but, in the words of Douglas Adams, it might have evolved suddenly into a copy of the ravenous bug bladder beast of trial. Chalmers concludes that the zombie argument meets all of these standards. If a possible world is justified as an epistemic possibility, based upon the constraints of combinatorialism, that's to say it's a situation that might have actually transpired given what we know about things a priori, then it possesses the quality of being an actual contingency. It's not merely pie in the sky. Its counterfactual propositions are to be considered as actual possibilities. The zombie world, whereby it's possible there might be no phenomenal consciousness within the bounds of nomological necessity, is an actual counterfactual. Chalmers' third step of five in his justification of Russellian monism argues that if the zombie world is an actual possible counterfactual, then the proposition the zombie world is true in a world considered as counterfactual or Russellian monism is true is true. The addition of Russellian monism to the proposition is a logical step. P is true, therefore the disjunction P or Q is true. Q could represent almost anything. If the music is loud is true, then the music is loud or the music is Beethoven's Ninth Symphony is also true. Chalmers defends the addition of Russellian monism to the proposition, rather than, for instance, the fact of the universe being a manifestation of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, as a consequence of Kripke's natural kind terms, which I looked at in episode 38. If water is H2O, is true, and both are rigid designators, then water is H2O is necessarily true. Consequently, if P is Q is merely contingent, then P and Q cannot both be rigid designators. If consciousness is physical, is contingent, as proposed by the zombie argument, then both consciousness and physicalism cannot be rigid designators. In these circumstances, according to Perabum, Russellian monism provides a potential escape from the argument's anti-physicalist conclusion. Chalmers' fourth step sums up the implications that if the zombie world is a counterfactual, then the necessity of physicalism is false. And his fifth step concludes with the proposition materialism is false or Russellian monism is true. Note again the meaning of the disjunction or, which according to propositional language indicates and or. The statement is true if either both parts of the disjunction are true or one part is true. The only case when the disjunction is not true is when both parts are false. 
The conclusion of this proposition, then, is that either only Russellian monism is true, or both Russellian monism and physicalism are true, but not only physicalism is true. The proposition claims that Russellian monism, the hypothesis that mind and nature share a common intrinsicality, is true while leaving open to question whether or not physicalism, the hypothesis that mind reduces to or is eliminated by nature, is true. I think Goethe and Schelling and Hegel would have been very happy with this proposition, which makes it a good moment to finish with another section from my piece, The Tower of Exantium. Thanks for listening.